Hey everybody, this is Death Crown Reviews, and I'm with Corypheus again. Corypheus, how you doing? And uh, so we recently watched uh, the Goblin Slayer anime movie, and we had we had watched the series as well. And uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today, Corypheus. Oh, we're kind of keeping a dog in check here too. <laughs> Lightning. Lightning's wanting her uh, get it her treat really badly, and, and there <laughs> she goes. Now she can chew away at that and stay occupied. Um, but yeah, you want to give us some details on some of the background about it? Uh. Um. So, uh, for those of you who who perhaps don't know. Uh, the Goblin Slayer is, um, it was actually, it looks like originally a light novel series, and then became a manga adaption, and eventually, after the normal process, it looks like, of things like audio drama CDs and, and the like has become an anime, it has a series out, uh, the first season. Uh, the second season has been announced, so that'll be cool. No, that will be cool. And a movie has come out on this. So, the basic concept, the plot of this starts, uh, and again, just for everyone, this is spoiler alerts, just... Yes, most, most of our discussions will be, will have spoilers. You know, just, we kind of go with the flow, and whatever catches our interest, we talk about, so... So, just... Just so you're aware, if you haven't watched it and plan to and don't like to have things spoiled, uh, set this one aside for a little while and then listen to it later. <laughs> That's right. Um, but the the basic plot of this starts, uh, a priestess, brand new, out of the temple, finally becomes an adult at the age of, that ripe old age of 15, and she becomes a low-rank adventurer. And as she is finishing up her orientation, another group of all the lowest rank, which in that world is the porcelain, they call it, the porcelain rank, uh, have decided to take on a goblin quest against the better judgment of the guild girl. And it should be noted, there are no character names in the traditional sense in this anime or series. So they all, the, the names that we give are not are the descriptions of who they are. And so just be aware. It's the description of their purpose in their world. Yes. So, um, so against the better discretion of the guild girl, the, the group goes off to slay these goblins. They, of course, thinking this is a very small deal. Oh, goblins are the weakest of the weak and everything. They get into the cave and are effectively put out of commission. It should be noted that this series uh, is somewhat controversial because of the horrific, um, many of the horrific actions that are insinuated and oh, discussed yes. within it. Especially Gob Slayer's backstory. Yes. Um, and they do. we will use the terminology as used within the show itself so that you guys can get used to that. So several of these people, one is stabbed and poisoned, which is nasty. Mm -hmm. um, one, uh, a sword fighter is butchered in place. They t attack him and start butchering him right there. The third, a monk, uh, a female monk, is taken down by a large hobgoblin and is made the plaything of... The goblins. Like I said, very controversial in this thing, but it makes sense within the world that they're in, and they I think they did a good job. We'll yeah. talk about that later. The priestess escapes with one of the companions. However, she is poisoned and is not thing. She is ready to die. She's, she's there. The goblins have come. Her fear overcomes her, and then enters the goblin slayer. Mm -hmm. The goblin slayer comes in and brutally kills every goblin in his path. There is no emotion as he kills. He simply counts them off. One, that's two. He is a machine. A and machine. and you, the Goblin Slayer, you never see really his face. It's always a helmet 
that has a full cover because he doesn't want to have anyone sneak up behind and smack him. No goblins. Right. Uh, and then after this is done, he gets down, he saves the girls who have been captured. And then he finds a nest of little baby goblins. At which he immediately walks in and dispatches. And the girl, the little priestess with her, says, well, what if there's a good goblin? And he says, I guess there's probably, maybe there could be somewhere in a cave deep down if you looked hard enough. But really, the best goblin is the one that never comes out of its hole. And then goes for it. So, the Goblin Slayer, uh, as a child, had his village attacked. Everyone was slaughtered. He watched from the basement his sister, his elder sister, whom he still, to this time in the movie, holds as being absolutely correct in everything, has idealized, in many ways, his sister. Uh, watched her from through the floorboards uh, as she has made the plaything of the the goblins and then brutally murdered. Um, he then returns, he goes through all sorts of training, returns later as the Goblin Slater, which is all he does. When he, he has joined the Adventure Guild, he is the third highest rank, which is silver, but he will not take any, he just hates taking anything that's not goblins, but he will take any quest that involves goblins, no matter how little it pays, no matter where it is, and he will answer any summons to that. Um, very quickly, three adventurers come within this world. The demon lord has come, returned, which he has no interest in, of course. <laughs> and so the races have combined to do this. However, the elf lands have started to have an issue with goblins. So three representatives, a, a dwarf spellcaster, an elf ranger, and a lizard priest, all silver ranks, come to ask for Goblin Slayer, who they can't really pronounce and call him various names such as Orc Blog and Beard Cutter. It's very funny within the show. And they end up going and joining a party. And the rest of the series and the movie is this party going around and slaying goblins. That's kind of the background of it. The yeah. movie is the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. One thing that stood out to me that was interesting in the artwork was how the blood would just gush forth when they would attack. And you had a story you, you, that you came across. About well, what it was doing is, is looking around. And um, for the, there's probably some people out here who are listening to this who will know this. But I found this very interesting. So um, one of the... One of the general tropes in anime, especially any anime in which there's fighting, is you will see a cut, there'll be a second to pause, and then just blood shooting out at high velocity. And as many of you probably can tell, I'm I'm not as familiar with anime. I'm still kind of cracking into it. But In fact, the, the joke, the rules of anime on the internet joke, is the human body contains over 12 gallons of blood, <laughs> sometimes more under high pressure it's just the joke because of the amount this happens so they they're they say originally the concept of this hierarchy in blood may have actually come from kabuki theater in which when they were acting and there would be a, a situation of blood they would throw a red silk oh, like yeah. scarf thing that was just long and it would throw it and it would kind of have this arch However, the most direct predecessor of this slash and just splurt was from one of the most influential directors of all time in movies, which is Akira Kawasa uh, Kurosawa. Um, did many, many very famous movies. I think it was like his movies ended up being like Seven Samurai. I think that's right. Anyways, a lot of movies ended up kind of inspiring directors that we know and love, George Lucas and all those kind of things that really became very influential. Um, in his movie Sanjuro, I apologize, I don't speak Japanese very well <laughs> at all. Um, he was known for being very picky. He actually one time had the crew change the direction of a river 
because he wanted it to go the other way. I mean, he was a very picky guy. Yeah. Um, so in this thing, there was a scene in, in Sanjuro where he sliced, and there was supposed to be, uh, there was a little mechanism that was supposed to spurt a little bit of blood and just drain it out, right? Right. Um, however, <laughs> when the scene happened, there was a malfunction in the thing. And so it sliced, and there was this moment of hesitation, and then all of the, the liquid blood, this fake blood, spurted out at once at high pressure. And apparently almost knocked the actor to the ground. Right. And they, they, and they remained in character. Oh, yes, because you did. You did not with Kurosawa. You stayed in character. <laughs> <laughs> and he liked it. He thought it was much more dramatic than the original thing. And there was probably the practicality of now everyone's covered with blood and he's got to try to do a second shot. And, yeah. But he seemed to have actually liked the drama of it. And that became kind of a standard. And a lot of things use it. And you see that constantly in anime. And a lot of people then attribute that in anime to that because many of the directors of these anime consider Kurosawa to be one of their idols and they often reference those kind of things in, in those kind of movies. So it became kind of a, it's a trope in anime, but it it's comes from that director. Right. Their, their love of that director, which I thought was really cool. That is really cool. That was, <laughs> yeah, that stood out to me quite a bit. I'd see the blood gush like that. And you'll see it quite a bit in fighting animes. There'll be this scene where there's, the, there'll be a slice and then there'll be this moment of hesitation and a lot of times it's when two characters are fighting and there'll be that slice and you won't know who got hit and then one of them will just splurt blood at high velocity out. It's a very dramatic like, way to do I that. now I know. Yeah. <laughs> now it's apparent. And this, this one is an extraordinarily... There's more violent animes. Well, I did see Elf and Lead a, a, quite yeah. a while ago and that one was quite violent. Yeah, that one was probably more violent overall, really. Than this one, yeah. Um, but this one's pretty, I mean, it has that, but what makes it easier is the, the goblin characters have that inhuman quality to them. And, which and maybe purposely makes, so. Right. Um, but what's interesting is that one of the theories of how a goblin, one of the theories of it is a person becomes goblin-like if they covet what is not theirs. When they have greed that is green like there's one of their two moons as they have a big green moon then a person becomes like a goblin mm. and and does that and there's several times where when you see the larger goblins they play off of that concept of human greed yeah. as part of the the thing which is kind of an interesting but they are they 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 are have become so inhuman and there's nothing redeeming about the goblins within this world there's no redeeming qualities so as you go through it, there's not anything you're going, well, you know, this is an interesting, you know, very complex debate. It's like, no, nah, they're just evil. They're just sort of enslaved to a certain animalistic nature, perhaps. Or... Yeah, and all they want, and they do, they can't make, they can't build, they steal, they take, they're, they're well, they're communists. Uh, <laughs> um, the commie slayer. Um... <laughs> But but that's the thing is is they they go through this entire thing and but one of the interesting things is and we talked about this is right in the second episode the Goblin Slayer actually points this out right he talks about how watching say he's like if somebody was to watch these brutal acts and then becomes somebody who wants this revenge against the goblins and he goes out and starts hunting them down. And goading in their holes, and sometimes he wins and sometimes he loses and he learns. Which is in opposition, like the exact mirror image of what the goblins do when they hunt. And he said, and then he brings up, he says, so in reality, I have become a goblin to the goblins. Yeah. And it, he really, that's what, that's kind of the interesting, that's the I am legend right. thing where the guy becomes kind of the creature of the night to the creatures of the night. Right. Well, and it even... As far of a stretch as this sounds, like James Bond, he's he's sort of our monster. 
Yeah. The sociopath that serves us. <laughs> well, and, well, and there's something to be said about that. We've talked about this, you and I, a number of times. Heroes originally, when you look at like Gilgamesh and when you look at like the old the old stories of heroes, they're they're not chivalrous, kind creatures who love and da da da. Even though in this case, like Goblin Slayer is actually quite kind to yeah. the people around him, even if it's he's indifferent to their. Right. Unless anything. you show a sign of a goblin, yeah, he'll, he'll 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 work with you. But but he he helps. He'll do all these things. But in in all the ancient stories, the hero was the monster who fought for you. Right. Right. And that's Takes a what, monster to beat a monster. That's right. And that's what the goblin slayer is. He has made himself into a monster to fight these monsters. And. He has taken that so extreme that he's almost become psychotic. I mean, at one point, the person he's living with, because he, he's living with a childhood friend and her uncle, and her family was killed when she was gone from the village. And she's lived with her uncle, and, and the uncle's lived with them. And even as he's, she is waiting for him one day at night to come back. She's sitting out waiting for him. And even the uncle says, look, I, I know you knew him. But you have to understand that he's just lost it. As he it shows him just slaughtering creatures with complete abandon. And he's right. The Goblin Slayer had lost it. He had completely lost it. And, um, and it's a very interesting concept. One of the things that makes this story interesting is there's a whole bunch of little tiny storylines within the major storyline of he kills goblins. <laughs> And one of it is how his companionship with these different people has actually started to bring his humanity back. Yeah, absolutely. So, one of the things I like about this is the the comp the, the story is so simple that they it allows the side stories to really blossom, and you see the characters. It becomes in a way. Because the plot is simple enough, it becomes a very character-driven narrative. And you really get to know each of the characters so well, in fact, that you don't actually need their names. <laughs> well, one, one thing that was interesting to me as well with the Goblin Slayer character is, you know, the, the armor he wears. And, and we never see him remove it. It's sort of a symbol of that prison he's put himself in. Yeah. limitations that have now been brought upon himself but as we were talking after we finished watching the movie we had talked about this sacrifice of possibilities and directions he can go created all these possibilities and directions for those other characters yeah, one of the things that's interesting about this is it's so there's so many complexities of existence that they just they don't sit there and dwell on they just let it be, and it makes it very interesting. One of the things is is he's he's driven by revenge. He wants the slaughter of every one of these goblins, but within the world that exists, the forces of this world are the gods, and the 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 story, the mythology is that the gods roll dice. They play these games by rolling dice, and all of the dice are like the. And the dice move these characters, these these individuals, around the board. You know, and for those who have ever played like an RPG, this is very, this sounds very familiar, right? This is what you do when you're playing an RPG, right? But in this case, there's, there's this situation in which he refuses to be ran by the dice. In other words... Even at the very end of the series, or the first season, it says he may not ever become the great, you know, platinum hero of the world or anything like that. But he, he thinks and he schemes and he comes up with this. And he never lets the gods play dice with him. And so even the gods don't know what he will do next. And the thing about that is they actually have a scene where he gets hurt badly and in it he watches his companion that you watch as his companions start to fall apart 
and it actually has the dice of the gods. It shows them. And it hits, and it has his cage, right? It's showing underneath the mask, and you see the cage, and it flips kind of back to the scene of him as a child watching through these same kind of slits as his right. sister is murdered. And then it flip, you know, you see back in his cage, and he hears his companions being about to be killed. And the dice land, and they land on snake eyes. They land on the one, which... If you're playing, you're done, right? You're playing the game. And it actually says that. It's like onward to death, like a nail driven into a coffin. Ah, you're bit. <laughs> and then it's just him that landed on Snake Eyes. And then you hear him say, bullshit. <laughs> and he stands up. And that's the thing. He has enslaved himself to this, like this armor. Yeah. This is who he is. But because he has done that, nothing can control him anymore. And because of that, everyone around him, all the people he helped, are given new life. New rolls of the dice. Because when he gets involved, suddenly it doesn't matter. And yet it's by revenge, it's by destroying himself that he's done this. And as you said, it eventually gives back to him. The process, what he's doing for them, yeah, uh, brings that humanity back into him. It's a, and so it, it, for all of its simplicity, it actually presents a whole bunch of really complex things because it's yeah. not every decision doesn't bring good or bad. It's just kind of a series of more choices, and how do you how do you respond to that? Right. Another thing that was interesting was how the the setting, the world, wasn't necessarily made. To serve the characters, it was just, you know, these characters with their limitations and their abilities are put in this world and it's just sort of, let's see what happens. Yeah. That was, that was fun. I thought you described well the last time we talked, though, the, the opposite of that, of a type of world where it's built to serve the characters. Yeah. And, and sometimes it can be done well, but in, in the case we were talking about, and I think they did fine with it, but it's, it's Harry Potter. Okay. Right? Harry Potter, it's kind of like, oh, there's a problem? Well, now we're going to do time travel <laughs> until it would be inconvenient in the next story, so we'll never use it again. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it's like, oh, we have magic spells just when it's convenient, and then when it's not for the plot, we'll, we so won't worry about it. So it's kind of like Deus Ex Machina or whatever, God in the Machine. Yeah, Deus Ex Machina. The, Machina, the, right. The, the God in the Machine just comes in. Whereas in, in that, they have what they call a hard magic system. And that is that there's a very specific set of rules that govern the magic. So, and again, it's very much based on the RPG model. So you have, each character has so many spells, which they can use so many times a day. Yeah. And they actually have to calculate this. So, like, there's certain times in the movie, uh, in, what was it, Goblin Crown or... Uh, it was, uh, anyways, in the movie, uh, they had this, this great scene where they're at Goblin's Crown, where they actually sit down and say, okay, how many, how many spells and miracles do we have? And they calculate them out. They go, okay, we got 12. This is what they are. Okay, and Goblin Slayer says, okay, we need to save this one. Uh, use these ones at your discretion, but be careful. And he actually calculates them out. And the thing about Goblin Slayer, he has no magic. Although he can use magic items like anyone else in the world. Right. Um, but if he uses it, you know, like he at one point he has a scroll, but scrolls are almost impossible to come by. And he uses it to save their lives and kill off what he needs to. But then it's like, he goes to the guy says, do you have any more scrolls? And he keeps bringing it up the whole series. Hey, do you got any more scrolls? Look, I'll try to get one. <laughs> but the hard magic system actually places them in a situation where they have to strategize constantly. There isn't just, you can't magic your way out of everything. You actually have so to plan for there's it. There's a cost behind right. the magic you use, yeah. And, and so, it, like, at one point... Uh, an ogre they're fighting realizes that the miracle that had protected them from his magic, they're like, I can now I know you're out of miracles. 
And then it, it puts him all in a bad case. And so one of the things that makes it interesting, the Goblin Slayer constantly has to strategize and he has to think about all sorts of things. And he's very cool in that he learns from everyone anything he thinks can help him, well, kill goblins. He's just not interested in much of anything else. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, you don't watch as much anime as me, obviously. Very seldom. You know, the first anime I ever watched, I wish I could remember the title. It was about these pilots. And they, they're in these sort of transformer airplanes, jet planes. Where, you, you know, you can fly, but then you can land them, and they're like mech warriors with guns. That was probably the first anime I ever watched as a kid. And I'd watched it over and over again. I, I, I recent, a few years ago, I found it again and started watching it, but I, I haven't been able to finish it. But I watched Elfin Lead, Inuyasha, I watched years ago, um, Evangelion. But that was, you know, seven years ago. Maybe longer, yeah. eleven years ago when I watched it, I I need to revisit it. I need to revisit it to see because they really do have great stories and great characters. There's some, lot of there's, them do. there's some great stories in there and stuff, and then there's of course just silly ones. But so you're the tropes and everything that are sometimes familiar to to those who are watching it, not so familiar to you. What what stood out to you either in the movie or in the series? From, from your perspective within the plot, within the characters? Probably what I, what I first mentioned. A lot of the artwork really stood out to me and how the blood sprayed and all that and the violence was depicted. Um, I really loved the Goblin Slayer character. How the, I, you know, I loved how symbolic the armor seemed and, and the emotionless quality of the character. There's Very never, similar. in every situation, no matter how violent it was, his tone of voice was always the same. And if he was brutally, you know, cut up or nearly decapitated or, you know, you know he, his, his emotional expression would not change. And yeah. he would just continue to push forward like a machine to accomplish what he needs to. Yeah. And I thought that was really fascinating and interesting. And I thought... I thought it was. I, I liked the character because of that. Yeah. But he was. It, that was what was interesting. Is I really liked him, but he was so alien to me as well. And usually, there's got to be something I can identify with more closely. But with him, it was hard to identify with that. But yet, I loved it. Yeah. So maybe it's maybe there's a party that goes. Oh, I wish I could take on that quality to some extent. Maybe. Well, you know, <laughs> you know, I, and I've said this before, but it is one of the single most manly characters. That I have seen in a long time. Very, the, the stoic yeah. quality. The absolute stoic, single-mindedness, unwilling to compromise and getting his goal, moving forward, adaptable, um, caring in that he he is constantly trying to help the people around him. He wants to avoid having. He wants them to avoid what he had to go through. Right, like he, you know, he always offers the opportunity for them that can help them in some way. Yeah. But he never mixes in foolish, dramatic emotion in it, and so he can let it go if it's if they're unwilling or. Well, and like there was when the the elf, the 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 elf ranger, is first going into this area, and she has watched one of her own kind. Uh, she has been brutalized, tortured. She's she's stripped, and hanging, as as in the refuse pile of this goblins, and watching what they had done to her kind and the people with her had traumatized her a bit. And she was really struggling. And at one point, the Goblin Slayer, he's just giving her advice. Don't drink too much. It'll make it, your blood will slow down and it'll make it harder for you to, to fight. And she starts troubling and he just goes, "Can you, you either can fight or you can't. Well, what will you do if, if I'm not here? I've done it before. We'll make do. But you either, you either can do it or you can't. That's it. That's the only choice there is. And it's so, it sounds so mean, but it's actually the most caring thing to do. She was struggling and it's like, look, I can't, you, you will die if you go down here this half-hearted way you're doing it. So either get in the game or leave. Right. And it, it, it's that kind of snap that does it. 
yeah, it's just reality and practicality yeah. to this circumstance, and he so easily just follows that direction. And... But there was this one scene in which he goes beyond maybe the practical, mm-hmm. and that is when he's talking to the sword maiden. The sword maiden is a gold rank adventurer. She had helped take down the demon lord from the previous demon lord. But as a young as a young adventurer, she had been beaten, tortured, made the plaything of, and and blinded by a horde of goblins. And these goblins are put in by the demon lord basically to to scare her. They want, you know, the demon lord's doing this to her. It, it, it's a little bit vague on that, but she knows this. She She's trying to get people to understand, so she kind of makes up a story when there other things have come in and are trying to kill citizens and have started doing this because she knows there's goblins and she starts saying, the goblins did this. Because she wants everyone to understand how horrifying goblins are, but no one cares. So she finally calls in the Goblin Slayer to come take these goblins out. And he goes through, it's a wonderful adventure, goes through this whole thing. But at the very end, he comes back and he says, you knew everything that was going on under there. And she says, yes. And she says, and you lied about the, you know, he basically confronts her with everything. And the whole thing is she just wants somebody to understand. And she wants somebody to do this and save her from this torment over every night having to relive what had happened to her. And he's like, I I can't, I can't do that. And he starts kind of walking away and she's upset. And he says, but if you ever have problems with goblins again, call and I will come and slay them for you. And she says, even in my dreams. And there's this moment, he's not even staring at her. He's looking back, total man move, right? He's looking forward, awesome. He goes, yeah, even in your dreams. <laughs> because I'm the goblin slayer. <laughs> and he just walks off. Better than walking off in an explosion, if you ask me. It was just <laughs> this. And what's funny is it works. From that point on, we get a letter later on from the, the sword maiden. She stops having those dreams. She can finally rest at night without those dreams because the Goblin Slayer was there. Yeah. And there's that amazing thing because it's, he was that big of a man, so to speak. I mean, he really was. He, he put his whole life and he wasn't trying to change the world. This is the thing. He wasn't trying to make the world a better place or change it or all he wanted was to slay the goblins. And because of that single-mindedness, he just saved people, person after person after community after community. And uh, eventually, at the end of the, the series, he has to save his childhood friend and their farm, and he has to bring everyone in. It's a very dramatic scene. And it's a similar thing in the movie, right? A girl has been taken, a noble girl, um, her party killed, she brutalized and, and marked with a chaotic god's mark. And that, again, he can save them. He can save them because Dag Namath, he's the Goblin Slayer! <laughs> <laughs> so is he a, a common character in many of the animes you've watched? Is there's, this a common theme? There, There is often a stoic character. Um, he is He's one of the more stoic. Um, but there's often a stoic character within it. Um, a character who just doesn't get, uh, there's often, I wouldn't call him a kundre. They, they have a term kind of called kundre yeah. where they don't really show emotion. And I wouldn't necessarily call him that. I think he just goes just plain stoic. And there are occasionally those kind of characters. Um, so I, I don't know common, common enough, Yeah. but if, if, it's common. He takes. He, he's one of the best examples. What would you say was your favorite of the other adventurers? Did, did you like the Earth Mother? The the priestess. Priestess. I, you know, we see so much change in the priestess. Right. You know, she's fifteen. I mean, she's she's an adult in that world. Let's let's be clear. This is not within her world. She's an adult. Um. 
but she starts out with kind of the high-minded hopes and immediately gets dashed because <laughs> all of her party gets killed. And then it's funny because she actually has mar mar uh, miracles to protect. And the Goblin Slayer figures out ways to use it to kill goblins. <laughs> <laughs> and at first, it, it actually it actually hurts her like to realize that she was given something that was used to kill that she thought was to use to protect. But in the end, you see her do the same thing, use the same miracle to, to kill again. And now she has reached that point where she understands. And, and I think that's the thing about it is with all the characters, you see the most change in the priestess. And so it's hard not to really like her. Yeah. Absolutely. Because everyone loves the character that makes that shift. Um, I'd say just for fun characters, probably the lizard priest. Because he's so happy all the time. Um, he's so helpful. And he's huge. And he loves cheese. I mean, how can you hate that? <laughs> <laughs> the guild girl loves, loves um, Goblin Slayer. So wants to ask. I mean, you could just see it. And all of her, and she just, she admires him because all the other adventurers think goblins are beneath them, and yet they're the thing that is slaughtering so many people and destroying so many towns. <laughs> and but the goblin slayer will do it no matter what, no matter how small the reward. He doesn't even care. There's times where he gets asked to go on the goblin quest, and he's like, "You can decide how much you want to pay me later," and he just starts leaving. And it's interesting to watch her because she's constantly around these adventurers all day. And she talks about how annoying it can get and how bad it can get. But she gets this soft spot for this one guy who cares so little about the things the other adventurers care about. The fame, the money, the glory. All he wants to do is kill. But within that, she realizes how much she, he does to protect. And I think that's kind of an interesting character. Yeah. The cow girl, his childhood friend, is interesting because... She is dealing with her own trauma of having her parents lost, having all that. And then it's almost as though seeking that salvation with the Goblin Slayer. Like the two of them are almost seeking that way out of the trauma together. And you see that in the very end when he returns after defending the thing and says, I, I'm back. And she smiles and says, welcome home. And you're like, oh. <laughs> um, so... I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say. Uh, the dwarf is hilarious. The elf you, is fun. But... You, you like them all and for their own reasons, yeah. Well, and that's the thing is the characters are likable. Yep. The, the main set. Right. Uh, there's a couple unlikable characters, but they're meant to be unlikable, so it's, <laughs> it's fine. The, who, the writer of this did such a good job in that the characters are likable. They're realistic for the world they're in. They, they seem real in, the, in their personalities, in the way they present themselves within the world they are. And um, from, a, from a perspective of a writer's, as you're looking at a storyteller's perspective, just so well done with the writing of it. Yeah. I also like that they used heavy metal when it was the goblins and him because he was pretty heavy metal. Like they would just have those metal chords that, for me, was a little out of place, I have to admit. <laughs> See, I, if, if they'd have done it for every character, it would have been... I would have been like, dude, really? But for some reason, with just him, because he was... Because he he's wearing the armor. Well, he was full metal. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> everything. And it was brutal. It was like... It, it wasn't... I, I, for me, yeah, it did kind of distract me. It pulled me out of it a little bit. Fair, fair play. I mean, it's just a, a it's a choice that, and I, it's whenever you make a choice like that, you're going to lose some people. Oh, you bet. Uh, but but it didn't ruin the whole thing for me. But yeah. yeah, in those moments, it just it did kind of distract a little. Was there a was there a scene that really struck you in in either the movie or the series as a whole? I really liked that epic battle with the hare, where he's you know he's battling that that goblin king or Padalon, Padamon, what was it? Pa called? Paladin. Paladin, and he's using the hare that he learned from. Oh the no, sass. that's that's the champion. The champion, right, right. right. Sorry about my 
misplacement of details. But yeah, he that that was a pretty epic battle seeing him wrap that hair around it until he, it rips and then He'd been all beaten and things and he grabs it and twists it around his neck and then when he can't go anymore he punches in and takes the eye out and And, and I really liked that scene where he, you know, his his sword's been the blade's cut off and he's crawling on the ground on his stomach and he's dragging himself with the blade of, you know, the, the severed blade of his sword. Towards the fight. Towards the fight. <laughs> that was really impressive. Um, that, that beginning scene that you talked about when the first goblins are killed. So here's an interesting, because it, it really was a bit controversial. Okay. And see, that... I. It didn't seem that way at all to me. I was surprised it was controversial. Yeah. It, I could see why Elf and Lead was. Oh, yeah. If it was it that one controversial. It was a little controversial. Because I could see why that one would be. <laughs> yeah. But this, little... but this one, I didn't think that at all. Never crossed my mind. The thing about it is Elf and Lead kind of occurred before there was a huge Western audience, if I remember right. And so the, the hardcore fans weren't too, like, they were like, oh, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Um, but there was a little bit of controversy, but not much. But this one, it, it, not not so much in Japan, but in the West, it, you know, it was very controversial. But here's, here's one of those examples why the story is actually a really uplifting one in every way. It's a, it's a very uplifting story. And by the end, you're like, you're happy. This is a good thing. But you wouldn't have been there if it hadn't been so dark. It really wouldn't have. Okay. The the violence, the gore, which wasn't too bad, but there was some. Mostly just blood. Yeah. But I yeah. A um, couple times a head split in half, but you know. Oh, yeah. well, the, the the goblin creatures. Yeah, no one cares. They're goblins. Right? Yeah, they're just uh, menacing <laughs> monsters. Good riddance. That's right. Um, that story could not have occurred had you had you had less. Uh, it wouldn't have been as good of a story. Oh, I agree. So, I mean, I think one of these things is if and, you're... And, and, and the Goblin Slayer's character would not have been as poignant if yeah. it had been less. Nor would the change, that the subtle changes he made been as, as profound to the, to the watcher or the reader. Right. That was a Lightning's opinion, apparently. <laughs> um, or little pups getting bored, I think. <laughs> But th that's one of those things that I think when, when you're talking about from a storyteller's perspective, it's, they, they do a good job in that they don't show too much. They show just enough. But they don't hide from showing it either. What they don't show, they make sure to insinuate well enough that you know damn well what's happening. Right. And, and the the you know like there's when she's being made the plaything and you see her crying and her eyes have gone blank and it's so much more horrifying than had they showed anything else yeah leaves so much more to the imagination and it it it, it brings you to that point where you, all you feel is for the character yeah you know, there's no other, it's, it's this moment of absolute heartache. And as you see this and you see the butchered corpse and the priestess is carrying the one companion who's poisoned and dying. And all she does is say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, over and over again as she tries to drag away from this scene. Even though they told her to leave, run, go. All she can do is, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And it rips you. I mean, it's heart wrenching, and then when the Goblin Slayer comes in, it's not—it's not the knight in shining armor. Mm -hmm. You appreciate the, the monster, the knight in uh, blemished armor, <laughs> and and they make a point of it because he actually gets made fun of for his armor quite a bit in the show. Oh yeah, they—I remember him mentioning, you know, you need to clean it once in a while. It's and, disgusting. And he says, "I can't <laughs> clean it because they'll smell the metal." <laughs> Every thought he has is it's, about is about his strategy. But know? but the violence that goes on to it—it's not—it's not horrific. It's not too bad. But it it was so necessary, and I I think that's one of the things we kind of are getting into a point where in society we almost don't want to talk or show violence. 
especially if that violence is traumatic. But that's what makes a story meaningful, is the characters overcoming the trauma. In, in The Goblin's Crown, you actually have one of the characters, the, the sword, the noble, the normal uh, sword fighter, this girl, has been taken, made the play thing, watched her, her companions slaughtered, been marked with this. And as she demands to go back with them, and Goblin Slayer allows it, and you watch her go through the trauma of what's happened to her. And her redemption becomes so much more beautiful because she has to go through this. Just to speak on uh, what you just mentioned about how the culture's changed and it's more reticent towards, you know, violence in stories. I, I was I was looking around at magazines. I wanted to submit one of my stories to horror magazines. <laughs> and I remember I came across one. I'm not, I can't even remember the name of the magazine. I wouldn't mention it anyway. But in the guidelines, it said, we want werewolves, vampires. We want frightening monsters. And then it said at the end, but no violence. <laughs> and I was like, that, I thought that was exactly what made these creatures scary. The vampire wants to suck blood out of you. The werewolf will rip you to pieces. No, and you the, see, what they, the, the horror is which one you're going to date. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I come across this, though, time and time again. No wonder so many of these horror writer f people I see are going to self-publishing. Yeah. Because they probably can't get published anywhere because everyone's afraid they might have some kind of violence in their story. <laughs> well, and, and what, I mean, what's the point if there's not... The That's... whole the whole point of it is the reality of the situation, whether it be the, the, the consequence of it. What wears... Life is harsh, hard, bitter, and cruel. That's what life is. Yes. And just because it can also be beautiful and stunning and wonderful and amazing doesn't mean that the former isn't true. Right. Exactly. And and the point of the horror writer isn't to wallow in the filth of life. It's to remind you why you don't want to get in the filth in the first place. Yes, and sir. what it takes to get out of it. And sometimes what it costs you to get out of it. Um, think of Salem's Lot. Think of the cost to the writer. Think of the cost, the cost to the boy, to the priest. When they find, it costs them everything. But that's what makes it meaningful. It's the same thing as you, as you listen to the original story, Dracula. The cost to him is so great, but that's what makes it so meaningful. What we're doing is we say, well, we want horror. We want excitement. But remove the engine from it. Yeah. <laughs> but but don't talk about cost. Right. Exactly. Don't talk about the trauma. We just want to see them overcome the trauma. But we don't want to actually talk about trauma. We just want spooky <laughs> atmospherics and, you know, moonlight and, and all that stuff. But not the real meat of the matter. That's right. It's like the telltale heart, except no one gets killed. <laughs> <laughs> And the guy just talks about how he hates the guy's eye. What's the point? Yeah. You know? Uh, and, yeah. it's it's And that's, I think it's one of the things that we've talked about this. It's one of the things that really gets me to to go into, um, for a while it was British, but I've stopped doing that because they've gotten worse. Um, but it got me into Asia looking for stories because it was like, at least they tell the story. And you know me. I, I'm not. I'm not blood, guts, and gore all the time. I mean, I my favorite horror is like oh, yeah. Clark Ashton Smith and and H. P. Lovecraft. Oh, I I I think you can go too far that way too, yeah. where where it becomes just gratuitous and 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 just for flaunting shock. Oh yeah. I think it can go too far that way as well. But but, but what's where where would any of those stories be if it wasn't for human sacrifice? Yeah. Uh, you know, all these terrible things, grave robbing and eating of corpses and, and whatnot. What does it say about, I mean, what kind of society lives without an understanding of cost? Sorry, this is this is going a lot in the we've, we've wandered into strange lands here. But, but that's what makes the Goblin Slayer's world so interesting. Because unlike some worlds... He is the epitome of cost. 
everything, you every cost is laid out on that metal armor. Well said. <laughs> and that's what makes it so powerful. Every one of those characters, the, the cost is etched into who they are. And because of that, you it doesn't matter that you don't have a name. It doesn't matter you can't see his face. It doesn't even matter if he's alien in the way you approaches you. You 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 root for him. You feel for him because he's paid the price. And because he's honest. Mm-hmm. He's an honest character. So, rating. Overall rating of Goblin Slayer? I'd give it like an A minus. I'm with you. I'm there I'm sure if we if we sat here and pick because there's here's the thing, it's not I think especially with the movie, I would have almost wished they'd have just done it as a, as an arc in season two. I think the story would have actually benefited Probably. From, from going at least yeah. the same time period, maybe another episode beyond so we could have got a little bit better idea of the characters. But with that said, I'd say, yeah, as a series and a movie together, I'd say a good A minus. Awesome. This is one, if you're even if you're not into anime, this is one you should watch. I say give it a go. Well, cool. We have discussed Goblin Slayer, amongst other other things about culture and society. Well, and within within the bounds of horror and, and, yes, sir. and literature. And uh, it was a good discussion. So this is Death Ground Reviews and... Corpheus. And we'll talk to you guys again soon. Pleasant dreams.